Hello, uh, Sustainability Advisory Council. Welcome to 2023. Thank you so much for joining and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, thanks so much. And again, uh, my apologies for the te technical difficulties we had. We also are lacking a translator today. Um, that is a hiccup with the way that our purchase orders work. And so what we're going to do is uh, we are recording the conversation today, and then we will have it translated after the fact and then um, uh, made available on our website so that people will be able to see it. Um, so as you recall, from my email, we have a fairly light agenda, which means we'll be able to spend um, you know, the time that we need on a couple of recommendations. Before we get started, I wanna make sure I know where we're at. So we know that the Energy Committee has two recommendations that they sent out to us in advance. So we'll start with those, but transportation, Stuart and Naomi, I don't recall, are you also going to be presenting a recommendation that you would like this group to think about and consider later electronically, or are we waiting for another meeting for that? We're waiting for another meeting for that. We didn't okay. finalize it with the subcommittee, so we'll be there by the next meeting. Okay, got it. So we just have the two energy committee recommendations, and then we will still do committee report outs as well um, after we get through these recommendations. Uh, does anybody else have any um, business items to add to the agenda before we get started? All right, well then energy committee, I'm gonna hand it over to you and I see Armando and I see Anna, I see both of you. So would um, either one of you like to take it away? Sure, so we've got a couple proposals for y'all today. Um, one specific to um, recommendations we have regarding the city's rebates. Um, and then another is more of a policy uh, recommendation for how we um, urge the city to engage in a regulatory process that's happening at the Colorado Public Utilities Commission. Uh, we do have the brains behind the rebates proposal with us right now. Um, so I wanna suggest we start with that one so that Jason can share a little bit about the proposal and answer any questions that you all have since I think that might be the one we're gonna wanna dig into the most here. So. Um, Jason, is it okay if I pass it over to you to introduce the proposal? Sure. Thank Great. you, Anna. Thanks for including me in the SAC meeting. This is exciting to see democracy in action and government in action. And I appreciate the volunteer time that all of you put into this committee. Um, it's been exciting to see. I'm a, a proud member of the Denver community um, to be part of this. So I uh, just wanted to say thanks to everyone. Um, the proposal that I put forth um, is regarding the rebate program. And, and really it's exciting to have this rebate program. I, I think it's the only municipality uh, in the area that has anything like this and it's very exciting. And the, the spirit of this proposal is to, you know, we're one year in, what have we learned and how can we improve upon these rebates moving forward? So the proposal is really coming from that spirit of improving um, upon the existing program. And I think you've all been sent the proposal. Um, the basics are to, to phase out the market rate rebates for solar projects. And when I say market rate, it would be for uh, homeowners above 100% AMI. It's to phase out the solar rebates for those um, households in the city of Denver and replace those funds, replace th th those rebates with rebates focused on common barriers. And the most common barriers that the industry is running into right now, and they're really de de deal killers. They're, they're, they're discovered late in the process. They're after a contract, they're after a sale, they're through the due diligence process. And the three big ones are utility transformers and the interconnection process can be required to be replaced by the utility. Uh, the roof rafters in a house um, can be identified as not being structurally adequate to hold the solar on the roof. And then the third one is service panels. Um, we're required to, to look at the grounding electrode system, which can um, turn into the need to do a new electrical service for the home. And those three things, when you have a normal system installation process can end the project. They're substantial enough cost and, and finding out about added costs late in the process. People have put together a budget, they've set their expectations, they've decided to make a, an investment 
And when that cost basis changes, it commonly kills the project. Um, additionally, these barriers are often more found in older homes and older housing stock. And so it also, the risk of these barriers also prevents some contractors from even entering any of these neighborhoods to try to sell solar for fear of running into these late stage obstacles. Um, so it just, it excludes certain neighborhoods in the city of Denver um, from active market participation. Um, so really the idea is redirect funding away from the existing program. And I, and I believe, and I think industry sees that the existing program actually provides rebates the way it's designed, I think unintentionally is providing a rebate for someone who really doesn't need one. Um, and so why, why not use that funding in a more focused approach and really focus that money on these barriers as opposed to providing funding for projects that don't really need it um, to begin with. So that's the, that's the spirit or the overview. I know there's a lot of details in the proposal and I'm, I'm here to answer questions more than regurgitate the proposal, but I thought maybe having some of that background of the spirit of the proposal would be helpful for y'all. And then I'm getting some direct messages because um, I did a very poor job of introducing Jason. So I just oh. want to quick clarify that Jason is on the energy subcommittee um, and is kind of the brains behind starting this conversation in our committee, which is why we invited him here today to get to take credit for something that he ultimately came up with and, and knows a lot more about than me or Armando. So sorry about that, Jason. <laughs> I, I apologize for anyone who's this strange person talking to us and why. So my apologies for that. Does anyone have any questions? Lori? Um, well, I did read the material, but I don't think it's sunk in, Jason. Um, how much money are we talking about that you want to redirect? And is it 100% of the funds? And where does the funding come from? Yeah, so currently the program is designed with a $4,000 market rate solar rebate. And um, so it would be taking that funding and Typically, transformers, transformer upgrades can cost, you know, on average around five to six thousand dollars. They can be higher, um, so I would suggest, you know, somewhere's around the five thousand dollar range with a cap. You know, so obviously it, you wouldn't exceed the actual expense, and it's really a utility expense. A contractor in the private sector doesn't profit from a transformer upgrade. It's a it's a it's a utility expense that the homeowner has to pay. So it wouldn't be going to the to the contractor anyway on the utility side. For rafter upgrades, they're two to to four or five thousand dollars on average. Um, so again, less than or approaching the current rebate. And the hope would be not one home would need all of these, right? You don't. Not everybody runs into all these obstacles at the same time. Um, you typically only run into one. So, and it's not the contractor determining if the barrier exists. The city determines if the raffer needs to be upgraded and the utility de determines if the transformer needs to be upgraded. So um, it's not a contractor's choice to like proactively do this. It's a, it's a requirement by the city or the utility. I hope, I hope what, that answers your question, Lori. What's the, what's the total amount of money available for rebates that you want to program, reprogram? Grace might know that answer better than me. I mean, actually, I'm going to pass 000. it over to Drew. Good. I'm Drew, gonna you need to you might need to introduce yourself to this group. Hi, all. I'm Drew Halpern, the uh, energy project manager. I work with Johnny, whom you're used to seeing. He'll be out for a little bit, so I'll be filling in. And I'm going to spend the next few minutes looking up what that number is because I do not have it offhand, but I'll, I'll get that in the chat quickly. <laughs> the, the only place I was going with this is, you know, why don't we do both? You know, where does the money come from? Why don't we do both? So I, I just sort of trying to explore this because I don't know much about it. So thanks. Well, I can partially answer that question. So the money is from the Climate Protection Fund. And so if you recall our five-year plan, we have the, the pie chart that says, um, you know, indicates what percentage of the dollars will be allocated to each of the different allowable uses. And um, the renewables category is slated to uh, receive about 20% of the five-year plan total. And so, um, you know, it's just, I think the money would just come from that pool. And the more money you use for, it's a chicken and egg, isn't it? The more money you use for rafters or transformers, the less money you have for just more houses with solar. But so this actually brings me to my question to probably to Jason. 
what volume are we looking at citywide on an annual basis in the category that you're specifically targeting, which would be the low to moderate income households? So how many projects does your industry have to turn down because of these two expenses? Yeah, and, and to compare that to how many market rate rebates would be qualified for through the other approach, right? So this is, so that's a question is which, which one is a larger and, and smaller one? We, we talked to Johnny about getting more industry input. I'm seeking more um, broader industry numbers. I can speak from our organization. You know, we had 15 projects in the city of Denver cancel because of rafter upgrades. Transformers have been a smaller issue. It's harder because it's all the projects that cancel. It's not the ones that, that move forward. Um, but it's a concern within the industry that it's going to be a growing issue. The more that we do electrification, the more that we do solar penetration, the more transformers will need upgrading. So um, that'll be an increasing issue. For us, I'd say we had 15 rafter issues. We had about five to 10 transformers in 2022 uh, that canceled projects. Um, you know, how many, the, how do we compare and what percentage of the market we are? I, I'd have to get back with some more numbers. I don't think this is a land rush. I don't think this is thousands of homes. Um, I do think this is in the tens to hundreds of homes at the upside. Just to add into Jason, uh, our program administrator Lee is planning on convening kind of a similar uh, roundtable discussion with other industry folks in the area to try and get like a better view on what the uh, challenge is citywide. Did I answer your question, Grace? Thanks. Uh, I, I noted in the, the recommendation document that it, you, whomever wrote it, said that the solar rebate program is most accessible to the highest income populations due to the heat pump requirement. I was curious what that was and will that, I assume that that barrier would still remain for having more moderate to low income folks taking advantage of this question? So the pro yeah, so the, the program is more generous at lower income levels. So below 80% AMI, I believe a solar project's free, like 100% paid for by the city and um, accessible without the heat pump installation. So what we're really talking about is anybody at 100% AMI or higher, um, how does that change? And right now, if you're 101% AMI, you would be required to install a heat pump. And for example, I have a friend who installed one and spent $30,000 on a heat pump with an $8,000 rebate from the city, which is great, but that was at risk. The contractor didn't know if that rebate would come through or not. And so he has enough capital and affluence to risk $30,000 and an $8,000 rebate on a heat pump because he's an early adopter and passionate about the technology. But since he had that much money and could risk it, now that he's invested $30,000, he's one of the ones who qualifies for a $4,000 solar rebate. And someone else who's 101% AMI might not have $30,000 to invest in their heat pump for their home or has a new heating system, it's not the right time, but are interested in solar they cannot currently access that solar rebate until they buy that expensive heat pump um, to then qualify for the solar rebate. So it, it causes consumer confusion. It also is causing some consumers to back away from solar projects because they feel like they're not getting a good deal because they don't qualify for the rebate. So consumers are confused. We've had a few people walk away from projects because they don't qualify for the city rebate. Um, so that's why I say the highest income earners, because you have to be able to afford the heat pump installation, pay the contractor, go through that process and invest in that heat pump before you even qualify to do solar, regardless of you're interested in doing solar. So it's slowing it down and then it concentrates the rebates into the wealthiest community members. So that, that's, why, that's what I meant by that statement. I, I don't know if that was clear in the proposal and I hope that further explains it. Yeah, yeah, I think it does. I mean, I guess... I, I know next to nothing about this, but as from what you just said and what's written there, it sounds like that the requirement for the heat pump as a precursor to getting any rebates is also a massive barrier. I mean, speaking for me, I would, I'm not low income, but I'm not high enough. I, I could never outlay 30 grand with a payoff over, I'm not going to be alive probably long enough for that to pay off. 
So I'm wondering if the committees, are you looking at that as an issue or is that what, uh, already debated and done? Well, the, 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 the proposal is to remove the heat pump requirement from the solar rebate and really just eliminate the solar rebate for households above 100% AMI and replace it with this one based on barriers. And the rationale is market indicates that solar doesn't need help for more people to adopt it. It does when these barriers exist. So focus the rebates where the barriers are to broaden who can participate as opposed to requiring an expensive, an expensive investment to then qualify for additional funding support. So it, it's, it's, it, I, I don't believe equity ends at 100% AMI. I do think there are people that are at 101%. And when they run into this barrier, then they decide not to go solar, yet alone not be in a position to invest in heat pump as well. I, there's also more heat pump funding coming from the Inflation Reduction Act, up to $8,000 for people below 80% AMI, um, and then half of that for 80 to 150% AMI. So I do believe the state will have heat pump program this year that will additionally support it. And I'm a huge supporter of heat pumps. My, my father installs them in Vermont. My brother is an energy efficiency expert. It's a fantastic technology. I just think there's some unintended consequences with that requirement in regards to how it's impacting the solar industry. Okay, apologies for, uh, I think I missed that in reading this, that you, you're proposing to eliminate the heat pump requirement as part of what you're proposing here. Well, it, it, yes, and it's not explicit, but the on, the that's only because it's removing the rebate for um, above 100% AMI to begin with. So it just eliminates it. it. It doesn't eliminate the barrier of the heat pump. It just eliminates the rebate and replaces it with these other ones that don't have a heat pump requirement. Does that make sense, Jim? Uh, it's, it's starting to penetrate a little bit. I understand it's complicated. I, I apologize. And I know you all look at a lot of different things within this program. So appreciate your patience, welcome questions. And, and yeah, I've thought about this a lot. I've been in the solar industry since 1998. I'm an electrical engineer. I've been installing solar in, the, in Denver since uh, 2006. So I'm well versed in the market. It looks like Lashida is in the chat is next. Yeah, so I um, I spent some time thinking about this and asking a lot of questions and calling people that I know in the industry and asking more questions because there was some parts of the application. I know that there's like probably some technical things in the application that I too got a little confused on. So if anyone else is confused, join the club of Lashida that was a little confused, but I really like this idea. I like this idea because it's coming from these not quite grassroots, but industry experts that are in the space that are finding out the things that are stopping people from adopting this. I mean, these are the people that have already said, yes, I want solar. Yes, I'm willing to pay for it. Yes, 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 yes. But then they go through the permitting process and they're hit with another $4,000. They go through the permitting process again and then they're told, upgrade the transformer on your block. I mean, seriously, I, I want to just, I want solar on my house. I think this is a great idea because it speaks to a bigger problem for every transformer that we help an individual pay for to get upgraded is one that's going to help the other six or eight houses that are on that block um, that that transformer is already upgraded. I think personally, Excel Energy should be upgrading all the transformers, but we already know the answer to that. It's not gonna happen. I can get off my wish list on that. So in the meantime, if we have the funding, I would love to see this happen. It's um, the rafter upgrades and the other thing. I mean, I just got done trying to go through solar. I, um, I don't know if you can see this picture here. These are my parents. I talked them into going solar, but all this other stuff, stopped them from doing it for two years. I mean, it literally put the brakes on things. So now we're hearing from the people that are in the field, talking to customers and seeing those customers literally say, sorry, not moving forward. So I would love 
for our funds to be applied towards the barriers that we know exist. I also love the fact that folks like my parents retired on steady income, but not very much, um, who want to be a part of this, who are living in the older homes and in the older communities, which helps me to feel like it's more likely to be utilized by the subset of our population that we'd like to see moving towards this because they're also going to be most heavily impacted with the rate changes with Excel Energy. And that was a big driver for folks like, I mean, it's a big driver in my household too, but more importantly for retired folks that are looking at um, fixed incomes, that's the word. So I'm a fan of this. I'd like to see the suggested AMI rate go a little higher as it as it is on some of our other um, rebate programs. I think 80% is too low because I can't imagine a two household income at $70,000. That's like HUD level rates. It's just, it was, it's nice, but it's low. And I, I'd like to see these barriers removed for a greater percentage of the population who decide to move down that path. And, um, and, and I'd, like, I'd like when this gets moved over to staff um, that they're able to apply some of the things like barriers at $2,000 for the rafter upgrades, the $5,000 for the transformers, and the $5,000 for the electrical panels. So I'm a fan. Um, I appreciate that someone from the industry who's identifying something that we'd like to see happen more frequently, tell us what needs to be fixed. And if we have the dollars, if money can help solve it, I'd like to see, I'd like to see us do that. So thank you. Thank you, Lashida. All right, Council Member Cashman, I believe you had your hand up next. Yeah, thank you very much. Lashida certainly opened the door for my quite just rookie questions. Um, the transformers are what a, a couple per block, or as how, how many homes does a transformer normally serve? I'd say usually around four homes. Um, it can be anywhere from two to six. Okay. Yeah, it does seem silly to me to ask an individual homeowner to foot the bill for a transformer that stays on Excel's system to earn that money uh, forever and a day. Um, I also, uh, uh, again, uh, adding on to uh, Lashita's comments, uh, just would want to think a little bit more about the uh, income levels uh, to be sure that we're going uh, down low enough into the income uh, ladder. But I also don't want to push people who you might normally say, well, he can afford it, she can afford it. But the type of added costs that we're talking about, you know, these people that we always say can afford things can also afford, you know, to pay market rate for college, which is, you know, 50 grand, 80 grand a year. So want to be careful and not push them out of the equation either. But uh, uh, thanks for the uh, presentation. And it, it, it's certainly something that uh, I think merits, uh, uh, you know, moving forward in the process. Thank you. Grace, I think you had your hand up next. Sure. I just want to follow, let me follow up real quick on that transformer question. So just so everybody knows, um, because since not everybody reads the rate cases for Excel. So the the first person on the transformer who's adding, the, the person who breaks the capacity, basically, whether it's a homeowner or business, they're the ones who pay the full cost to upgrade the transformer. So just that want everybody to know, and that's in that's in Excel's tariff structure. Um, and that is something that we are interested in working with them on. If you saw the chat, that's what Drew and I were talking about, that we do have a plan for our office to work with community planning and development. They're the folks who know where all the um, all the new developments are gonna be. We're able to, uh, to uh, identify where we think um, capacity is gonna grow based on our own policies. And then we're gonna layer that with data that Excel is going to be making available sometime this year 
to show where their capacity is across the city. And so then we'll be able to show them, here's where you need to develop, you know, you need to build out your capacity network. Um, they are unwilling to do that without a change in their tariff, but they are open to the idea that that might be something they need to pursue in order to make this happen. So just wanted to give that clarification. I think I, think I may have forgotten my question. I know, if you don't mind, I, I, I try not to get involved in your discussions because I want them, I want you to just have them, but I would like to play devil's advocate for a minute. Um, now, number one, I, I appreciate the equity focus of this discussion, but I do want to make sure that everybody is also aware of the fact that we have separate programs that are 100% for um, affordable housing and, and people with low incomes that address all these same issues. And I guess as the and provide provide up to 100% of the cost for those, whether they're homeowners or renters, whether they're in single family homes or in apartment buildings. So I guess my devil's advocate question is, do you not believe that there should be any programs from our office for market rate people or market rate households in order to continue spurring the market for these new technologies? And Jason, maybe you can address that by the idea of decoupling solar at all. But I think I just wanted to put that out there to the group because I've heard that a couple of times that you know, there's a focus on equity here, which is important, but we do have other programs that do only that. And I uh, just wanted to ask that question. Is that directed to me, Grace, or is that to the broader group? It's generally to the broader group. So it's, I mean, the main question being, if the which is which is the primary issue here? Is it to assist people who have low incomes and absolutely can't do solar um, without assistant financial assistance for rafters or transformers, or are we looking at? So I see Lashita shaking her head. So which which AMI bracket are we looking at? And I don't recall is that specifically in the recommendation so that it's it's clear to us what you need us to look at? Yeah. So. So to your point, below 100% AMI, there are more generous programs, and I'm not suggesting removing a solar rebate for anyone under 100% AMI. That would still stay intact. What I'm suggesting is above 100% AMI to repurpose the solar rebate to a barrier-focused rebate, as opposed to the current program, which gives that rebate only to those able to first invest in heat pumps, which adds to wealth concentration, because you need the capital for the first investment before you can even access the funding for the second. So it, it's just, it's too much funding for those who need it least. And I guess someone experiencing a barrier at 101% AMI would not go forward with their project. And I, I don't think equity ends at 100% AMI. I think that there is, you know, and the way the IRA handled this is they said, you know, 80% to 150% qualifies for a lesser rebate than someone who's less than 80% AMI, but it doesn't end at 100% AMI is the way the federal government designed the IRA. So I think this is a way to try to target barriers to people impacted. And to Lashida's point, these barriers are more commonly um, exist more commonly in older housing stock and older neighborhoods that that tend to have equity issues in them to begin with, regardless of income levels. So so this would help the intent is to try to help target the individuals who need to overcome these barriers, as opposed to the concentration of rebates to the wealthiest that that that's the intent of the change to the program. Is that does that I, I do think that there continues to be there needs to be support, especially for heat pumps and new technologies. Um, I do think there needs to be support for solar. I just think we can work in partnership with industry and government and target what we are, have identified as the greatest barriers to broad adoption. And let's, let's use money to, to close the gaps as opposed to you know, potentially benefit those who don't need it. Lashita, did you have another question or is your hand still up from before? Okay, cool. Then Lori, I think you're next. Well, it just sort of goes full circle to what I was saying about how much is in this program. Is it Does it have to be either or? Are there opportunities to do what this, this committee is requesting, which I think is terrific, 
but do we have to completely get rid of the solar incentives for people that are, you know, in my bracket, I, I, I can barely pass that standard, but I do. I live in a hundred year old house. I, I'm not sure I want that program to go away for me. Um, I don't know what to do with the heat pump issue because that's sort of thrown in on top of it. But um, I would still like to see solar incentives, but I, I think this is really sensible what you're proposing. I'm just not sure it's totally either or, um, which would be more a question to Grace. Like, can we do both? <laughs> can we do more? Um, and, and that's always a hard one. So my, my only feedback, Lori, and I love it as an industry member, the more support we can get for solar on roofs. I mean, that, 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 that's awesome. I think the concern is it's a very popular, um, there's a lot of market momentum, it's very popular and funding in that range would just, there'd be a lot of like demand for it. And then just what's the capacity or how much money and what's the best use of money? You know, is it to incentivize a new technology like a heat pump that's still relatively expensive and with fuel costs going up, people who pay for gas heating, I don't know if you've all seen your recent Excel Energy bill, but mine increased significantly over the past two months. And I do think that's gonna become part of the regulatory issue is the cost of gas. And so, you know, as you have more pressure on heating your home and people who are using gas appliances, there's gonna be more heating on sw switching over to electrification. So I, I appreciate wanting all of the above and I'm sensitive to where the money's needed. And, and you know, I think increasing the rebates to heat pumps and looking at what the IRA is coming, I think that would be really great use of money, especially where lower income community members are gonna have higher gas bills this year. And you can't solve that with, um, with community solar garden subscriptions for free electricity, somebody's still gonna have a gas bill. So, you know, that's the complex of energy consumption that's going to evolve over the next decade. Do you all feel ready to take a vote? Armando, did you want to add something? You came off mute. Uh, no, I've been off mute. No, I'm just oh, uh, yeah. grateful to, I, I would actually have grateful for Jason for sticking with the energy committee. And, um, you know, he's had these um, these feelings about the rebates and, and these ideas for a long time. And he's been very patient in, in getting the recommendation together. And so it's it's great to see everybody having this awesome conversation. So yeah, thanks, Jason. Thank you. And Grace, the vote is for exact, would say exactly what? Stephen, was that your question too? I was well, gonna ask, I was gonna mention that we should probably repeat specifically what, because if I remember right, the ask is really for Grace, for y'all's office to review this recommendation, we're not voting that the changes are going to be made, right? We're just voting on whether or not your office should review whether those would be viable changes, right? That's right. The the your what you would be voting for is to um, approve this recommendation to move forward to CASER. And then our obligation is to review it and come back to you with our response. Our response, feedback, all the different adjectives you'd like to put to it. Yes. Is it a review or a full endorsement? Like you mean a, us? What our part is? Yeah, like no, oh, for no. us, is it appeal to review this proposal for you yeah, all? Yeah. So what exactly? With all the recommendations that you make to us, our that our obligation is to look at it. It's to say, okay, let's take a look and give you an official response. Like, yes, we can do it. No, we can't. Or we can do something in the middle. And here's what we can do. And here's why. But it's also implied if we're asking you to review that we think this is a serious strong recommendation. I mean, at least to me, I, we're not going to ask you to review things we're lukewarm about generally. Yeah, I think if you if you're endorsing this recommendation, it's because you believe it's a good idea. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to move it. I think I think we're ready for I'm ready for okay. a vote. I think it's a great idea. Well, but I think the, the key that I want to make sure I'm understanding and, and maybe others is, is that so Grace, your group will review it, come back to us and tell us okay, this is not viable because of cost or it is viable, but here's how much extra it would cost. Here's what we, based on what monies we have and we needed to reallocate, here's what it would look like. So based on your review, you would come back to us and say, this is what we found out. Now, 
you know, is it is this still something, especially if there's reallocation of resources, right? I think maybe. I mean, I don't think I would ask you to make that level of decision. I think what will because this this energy committee has been talking about this for a while. So this isn't the first time we've heard of it. I would say that what we're gonna do now is take a look at it and come back and say, okay, here's what we think we can do. And you know, whether that's a full-throated endorsement, and yes, we're gonna do this 100 percent whether it's a complete and total rejection um, or if it's somewhere in between and we'll come back and tell you, here's, we, here's what we're going to do next. Cause I think we, we don't, it's not the role of the SAC to uh, have to get into that level of detail and have us come back and be like, should we do this? Should we not do this? Um, this is going to be the first one, I think, where we really come back and say, I don't know what we can do or, or if we, I, I can't exactly predict, but if the fact that we haven't, done all these um that we haven't made these changes yet uh the fact that it's come to you is certainly indicative that we need to look at it a little closer so this is probably the first experience we're going to have um coming back to you with maybe not 100 percent of everything you're asking for but we'll see we might okay. thank you i just want to acknowledge naomi's chat you're getting at how could other rebate sources offset changes caster could based on outline yeah, I was just trying to get at if we change the way in which the rebates are currently done and there's, you know, the heat pump piece or whatnot, there's that in the federal legislation. But if there's, and to be clear, I'm a novice at this. So like, Jason, I appreciate you so much in answering all these questions, but like, are there other funding sources that could help supplement all of the things that are needed in order for someone to install solar um, based off of how their um, the recommendations outlined? Sure. And I guess what I can say to that is we are definitely watching the IRA and we'll continue to watch other federal sources to determine if those, and this, let's say the state too, right? So, because some of the federal money will flow to the state, we have to see what they're going to come out with with rebates. We will adjust our rebate amounts in all of our categories when there are other sources available so that the stack of rebates available to consumers, we think still will move the needle in the market. That's our objective. It's just that those are consistently evolving. They're not fully set yet. Okay, so back to the vote. Sounds like you're ready to take a vote. And the way we've done this before is you can just use the raise hand function and I'll just do a quick count and make sure that we've got a majority of who's here. Yes, I'm seeing I'm seeing everybody who's a voting member minus one. So we, I'm just counting on my screen that looks like 12. Okay, then that motion passes. We will and take then, a look at, at it. Hey, Grace, Sorry. Lorena before she left. Oh, yeah, yeah, then Lorena did. And Marcel had registered his agreement okay. um, since he couldn't attend today. He's uh, in transit. Cool. All right, thank you all very much. Energy, you still have the floor. You have another recommendation. Yeah, well, thanks, y'all. I appreciate the robust discussion here. Here, I'll lower my hand. Um, Jason, thank you so much for your help, for your expertise. We'll move over to the other recommendations, so you're welcome to stay, but I also know it's still the work day if you want to head out. I need to run. Thank you so much for your time. And again, thank you for your service on the SAC. I really do appreciate it. Um, and till the next time. Thanks, Jason. All right, thank you. Um, all right, for proposal number two, Armando, do you want to jump in here or do you want me to take this one? Oh, no, and I couldn't take it from you. This is your baby, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, all right, would it be helpful to provide a brief overview of this proposal as well? Okay, great. I can share a little bit about what we're hoping for here, why it's important right now, and then um, why we think it's important that the city of Denver specifically take this policy position. So as far as the what, this is different from our first proposal, which is specific to a recommendation we want um, CASER to review regarding rebates. This is a recommendation regarding the city of Denver's policy position on natural gas fired power plants in Xcel Energy's um, long-term energy planning process. It's called the Electric Resource Plan at the Colorado Public Utilities Commission. Um, so it's a state regulatory policy position um, that is specific to the building of new gas plants on Xcel system, as well as the plan for hopefully the transition of the South Denver-based Arapahoe gas plant. Um, and so to summarize the position we're hoping the city will take in this process, we think the city should take the position that no new gas-fired power plants should be built on Xcel Energy system. 
Um, and I'll explain a little bit why in a, in a second here. And then second, um, in that same PUC proceeding, we urge the city of Denver to take the position that if Excel considers a new, what's called a power purchase agreement or lease basically for um, the Arapaho gas plant when it expires this year, the contract's new duration should plan for the earliest possible retirement and not exceed the end of the year 2030, which is the year that the city has a goal of being 100% renewable energy by 2030. Um, as far as why this is important right now, so XL Energy, our utility, is going through a process that it undertakes every four years. It's that long-term energy planning process that I mentioned. Um, and it's where they make big decisions about how they generate our electricity. So are they retiring anything like a coal plant or a gas plant? Are they extending the life of anything or are they building new things like wind and solar and in some cases gas plants? And so they are gonna make that decision this year at the Public Utilities Commission. And why Denver is that the city of Denver, like many other stakeholders, is a formal intervener in this regulatory process at the PUC. So that means that the city gets to weigh in with policy positions to influence the process and influence the PUC's decision about Excel's plans. The city of Denver is one of many stakeholders in this process. Sierra Club, which I work for um, outside of this, um, is another stakeholder. Um, other cities are involved, uh, unions, advocacy groups, businesses, lots of stakeholders. Um, we believe that a position that opposes building new gas-fired power plants and plans a transition for Denver gas plants like the Arapaho gas plant best reflects the city's value around equity, um, as well as the city's goal of achieving 100% renewable energy by 2030. So, a couple of other just little fun facts here um, to inform any discussion and maybe get ahead of some questions. When it comes to new gas plants, Excel already owns nine gas plants in Colorado and they lease six more for a total of 15 gas plants that actually translates to 43 smokestacks that are polluting our communities by generating um, gas fire electricity. And we know from a 2020 analysis that Colorado's gas plants are disproportionately located in communities that have a higher share of people of color um, and a higher share of low-income households when you compare it to the state average. Um, not to mention that most of these gas plants are in Colorado's ozone non-attainment zone um, and is contributing to air quality issues that we have in the region. Uh, when it comes to Denver's gas plants, we Sierra Club did an environmental justice analysis of the neighborhoods around the Arapaho gas plant last year, or no, two years ago now, in 2021. Um, and we found uh, a couple of key things. Uh, they're not surprising, but that this gas plant pollutes nearby neighborhoods with air pollutants that are bad for human health. Uh, we found that it's located in a part of the city that's already disproportionately impacted by many other combined sources of localized pollution. Um, and then that it's located in a low income community of color that has higher than average health burdens and rates of COVID-19. So for example, this community around Arapaho has a higher rate of asthma than other communities in the Denver metro area. And then, um, you know, when you look at things like demographic indicators, the three miles around the Arapaho gas plant has a people of color population share of 45%, and that compares to 32% um, for the full state. So um, we see this as a big environmental justice and equity issue, which is why we'd like to see the city of Denver supporting a transition off of that plant by 2030. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that Sierra Club and Mi Familia Vota did a listening session or hosted a listening session in the community in November. Um, 37 people attended and most of them weren't Sierra Club members or Mi Familia Vota members. They were folks in the community that heard about it had seen the thing, didn't know what it was and wanted to come learn more. Um, the, in, our, in our proposal, I linked some slides that summarize some of that event um, and some of the survey results we got from asking people things like, do you have a favorable view of the gas plant to which we had a 0% uh, response rate to that. Um, and I think that probably covers most of what informs this proposal, but happy to answer any questions if folks have them.
I guess my my one thought was I expected your presentation to be more militant, and it seems uh, quite reasonable, and um, in full support. Thank you. Yeah, I think one thing to point out here is that this isn't a general like ban on gas plants in the city of Denver, right? Or a, or a general policy position on all gas plants. This is a very, very narrow um, recommendation specific to one regulatory process that's happening now where we think the city of Denver could play a role in supporting um, investment in clean energy over fossil fuel infrastructure that will burden ratepayers for decades to come. Lori. Uh, I just want to understand how this works when we refer it to CASR. So again, CASR would look at this and I mean, because it's a policy recommendation, but it still goes through the CASR lens of whether we should move forward on this, right, Grace? Yeah, and I think um, maybe that pairs well with Lashita's comment in the chat. Um, Anna, could you address that? Is it a concern that our office won't have this position? Um, so the part of the process where we'd have more insight into that will happen later this spring. So the city of Denver, along with other stakeholders, will get to weigh in with specific policy positions. And so um, I think what this will do is, you know, support CASER to have community leaders support in any positions that they could take to avoid new gas buildouts or start to think about the transition for the Arapaho gas plant. Um, so I think this is just an action that we can all take if this is something that we support to say this is what some Denver community leaders on SAC think and the city can use that to inform their position. So if I can make a comparison, last fall, the SAC endorsed the concept of pay as you throw. And then we were able to share that with other leaders in the city to say, see the SAC endorsed this. And it was used in the public presentations. I see. Um, about that program. So is this this is the same idea that should we need to make that case? Because we don't make those, we don't do our, um, how do you say, we don't do any filings without going through the mayor's office. So perhaps what you're saying is, should we face any resistance that we this could be one more thing that we show, see, this is what the people want us to do. And would be in addition to other community engagement that, for example, Sierra Club and Mi Familia Vota can, um, intend to continue doing around the Arapaho gas plant um, to show community support in Denver for transitioning away from gas towards renewable energy. David? So, and so, Anna, and this may be a question for Grace to my one of my so. The Arapaho, I mean, I get the equity trust, right? I mean, that's one of the things that we're all here for and agree on. The one question I have, though, is I think we need to be, I'm wondering, I'm trying to figure out how to put this in the right words because I'm not a power plant expert, but we, in the Energized Denver Ordinance, it has um, natural gas, clean natural gas backup as an option for property owners in the event that, right, we all know how cold it can get here. We've experienced it the last month or so. So I guess my question is, you're making sure I understand, we're talking specifically about the Arapaho plant and making sure that as its end of life comes that it's closed down in the right way. But you're saying of all the other natural gas plants, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, is there going to, based on, you know, the say 2050, as long as we still have the ability for the natural gas backup piece of the Energized Denver Ordinance. Grace, you follow where I'm going on that piece? Keep, go ahead, keep going. I'll follow. So in Energized Denver Ordinance, even as we start, even as buildings start to go electric, they still have the ability to have natural gas backup for when, there is not the ability to 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 to, to fuel the grid with the with the renewable energy piece of it. And Drew, yes, maybe, Stephen, I think Drew I get where you're up. going. Um, okay. And I just want to clarify: it's two different systems, right? So it's the gas system of XLs, and then there's the electric system of XLs, and they're totally right. separate. So 
this particular policy positions wouldn't impact Energize Denver because it's the Arapaho gas plant is simply an electricity generation resource that Excel leases from another company to deliver electricity to, to homes um, and isn't related to the gas system at all. Does that oh. help answer your question? Yes. Okay, cool. And then just for reference to, this is a very small gas plant. I think it's Excel's second smallest gas plant in the state. It's 126 megawatts. You could compare that to the other gas plant in Denver, which isn't going to come up in this particular regulatory process that has four smokestacks in Globe Valeria Swansea, the Cherokee gas plant, um, that's over a thousand megawatts. So this would be a gas plant that relative to other existing gas infrastructure on our electric system um, would um, hopefully have a smoother transition and then be able to be replaced with solar and storage and, and other resources. Jim. Uh, a couple of quick questions. One, just so I understand it, it sounds like from what you said, that's when I try to understand this, that there's a, a PUC process that's ongoing yes. and Denver is one of, I assume, many municipal stakeholders. Um, Pueblo and Boulder are the only other cities that are um, formally intervening in the process, though many okay. um, cities have submitted comments or had uh, council members or you know county commissioners weighing in. Okay, so Denver's already said we, we want to have a, a heightened role in this conversation. Denver's already an intervener, so there okay. wouldn't be additional costs associated with this. Okay, so we're trying to provide some guidance to as they intervene for what we hope that they will argue for or against. And Grace, if you have anything to add in there, please do. I don't want to look like I'm speaking for the city's. No, I think and, and again, this is this is only to influence Denver's own testimony. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then the second question was, is it, it, looking at the, the short description, it sounds like we're um, asking the cities, they were trying to influence the city's position on two things. One is for Excel to build no new gas fired power plants anywhere in the state. And second, to limit any future purchases of power from the South, uh, the, 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 the Sun Valley plant for a very limited period, if at all. Correct. Okay, got it. Thank you. Do it. I, I, I'm a novice, so I apologize if I sound really stupid here. But you know, when the, when there are uh, station area polluters, they have a certain allowance, um, essentially within the system. Um, short of having a carbon trading um, system set up between facilities, shutting something down like this are you giving away your right i know it sounds horrible to pollute that amount you Doesn't, mean like if this if xl were to make a plan to transition off this plant could they just burn gas elsewhere yes Is that what you're getting at yes they could they absolutely could um i think that's something that stakeholders would want to weigh in on at the Public Utilities Commission regarding Excel's plans for replacing that power. And that's going to be a conversation that will play out over a period of time. Excel has a couple of different electric resource plans that need to happen between now and 2030. So for example, if we end up at the end of this regulatory process, where multiple stakeholders have weighed in saying, transition off this thing, and Excel goes that route, this is all hypothetical, of course. Um, they would have a lot of time to plan for that transition, right? It, it wouldn't be overnight. And there's a lot of steps that would need to be taken to redevelop the transmission infrastructure, for example, that currently takes power from Arapaho to other places. Um, and that even leads out the question of what will the company that actually owns that plant do with it, right? Because this is just regarding Excel's lease of that plant that will likely be extended when it expires this year. Okay, I brought up the rack because I know a stationary source that they deal with plants like, you know, Suncor is allowed to pollute X, you know, and that's mm -hmm. worth something, that's worth money um, mm -hmm. to be able to do that. And, you know, I just wanna make sure that we're not, that we understand the full ramifications of shutting down a plant um, economically. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm supporting those who have allowances to pollute. <laughs> Got it. 
anything else to answer your question, Stuart, or is that it? Okay. I see a question about, um, this is phase two of an electric resource plan, not phase one of the, of the rate case to answer that question. So this is where um, Excel is making decisions about what they want to build or retire or change, not how they're going to pay for it. That's the separate process, which is the rate case that you mentioned. Any other questions? Sounds like you're ready for a vote. I think so. All right. Let's go ahead and do the show of hands again. I'll just count it up. So now we're down to eight. Eight, nine, 10, 11. Oh, there we go. All right, motion passes. You're certainly giving us plenty of work to do here at the beginning of the year. <laughs> not, not difficult at all. All right, thank well, thank, thank you all for that. All right, so back to the our agenda. Great. So let's see. You know what? I thought Mike was going to be here. I don't see him. So I guess Stuart and Naomi, I'm not sure if you were updated on this. Oh, Mr. Cashman, do you have your hands up for something? Okay. So we're going to do committee report outs. And I guess I'm just going to give you one quick update. You may recall that the Sustainable Transportation Committee had made a recommendation last year that CASER should put out an RFP to uh, create a program that would enc encourage cycling, just cycling, no e-bikes, just riding a bike. And so we did put out an RFP, but it closed this past week and um, no, we didn't have any bidders. So Mike is going to reach out to those who he thought might bid. And we actually have that information from those who downloaded it from the website. So he's going to reach out and see if he can get in, any information from them about what were the barriers, uh, what maybe didn't interest them, uh, and ways that we might be able to tweak it to generate more interest. I see Stephen and Stuart first. So great. One of the things I just thought I would put out there is I don't know how if they've connected in with Downtown Denver Partnership. They've been doing some studies around cycling and uh, we've been supporting them with figuring out what buildings have bicycle storage facilities within their buildings. And I was asked to be on a task force. They're going to be looking at some kind of bicycle secure storage at Union Station and stuff. So maybe through that, they've got some people that they could recommend that maybe weren't aware of it just to okay yes thank you for that and yes we have been talking to ddp and um we'll follow up make sure that we follow up with them as well Stuart, go ahead yeah um we didn't bid and i know that my neighboring tmas didn't bid on it solely on the basis that it was highly labor intensive and that the budget wouldn't allow for um su sufficient staffing uh, to be able to administer this type of program and that we collectively have a recommendation back to you folks that, you know, is this something that the city could staff and then groups like the TMAs and others could promote it and, and manage it from that angle? Um, you know, if each individually have to staff up for tracking this, that gets very expensive. So there seemed to be a need for a centralized function with a, a warm body that could handle that um, to enable this to happen. But with that set aside, we all are very appreciative of this offering. And we know that you know it, it's gonna need to be tweaked a bit, um, but it is something we really want to deliver to our service areas. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm sure Michael follow up with you for more information. All right. So we're going out of order, but since transportation is already talking, um, Stuart and Naomi, would you like to start out with your report out, please? I'd like to shake things up once in a while. <laughs> well, so everybody let, be ready. Let, let me tell you the status of uh, what we were hoping to propose today. Um, it's, uh, we call it our um, bus uh, stop coolification initiative. Um, it essentially gets at the issue of uh, transit dignity and making bus riders feel like they are a priority and to give them something uh, that provides all the functionality that you need from a bus stop, 
but to also connect it with the character of the community because we've looked at other cities like Philadelphia and others who have done these types of things that um, you can actually have a bus stop that the neighborhood feels like they own and um, and bus riders are proud to stand there and uh, don't feel like as like a uh, say as a you know a hooker standing next to a pole on a street <laughs> you know and that's I, i'm i'm quoting from my surveys that uh, that uh, that's what they say to me sometimes that when they're standing out in the street corner so um, we will have that by our next meeting so that is a a priority for us it was a fun one to explore Naomi, Naomi, did you have things you wanted to add? Yeah, and I would say on that one too, we think about, especially as the climate's changing, you know, I had my personal experience taking the bus on really cold days. I can't even sit on the bench because it's just freezing. So really trying to think about what are the ways we can help people that want to use our transit system, especially given our changing climate. Um, I was trying to find the document. It's not in the full recommendation form, but I'm going to pop it in the chat before we end. So you can just see the examples of um, what it could entail. And I think through our conversations with Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, we learned a lot, especially around you know which bus stops are under the city's purview versus RTD and how do you navigate those kind of nuances with this ultimate goal of just providing um, dignity to transit riders. So we have that. We're still exploring um, this concept around a public awareness um, campaign and using climate protection funds you know, to really educate people on emissions and the changes that they can make in their behaviors around how they get around Denver. Um, still trying out how that makes sense. But to that end, you know, we're really trying to bring in speakers. So um, the Denver Regional Council of Governments came and presented about their efforts to address, you know, public behavior change. We'll hopefully have a speaker um, from the Colorado Department of Transportation to talk about the ways in which they're using their funding to support behavior changes, um, just as an added layer to see, you know, what's the best use of funds, what could, what kind of a program could be successful. Um, we have like five or six subgroups that I think we'll start convening in the next year to look at other recommendations. Um, Mike from the Castor office is going to give us an overview of the city's plan as it relates to electric vehicle charging and infrastructure to see if there's any recommendations there that we can make. Um, but yeah, I think we've had a really great year in 2022 with recommendations coming to you all and get ultimately getting set to Castor and anticipate that there will be more to come. Thanks. Any questions for the Sustainable Transportation Committee? All right. Um, how about I go over to Buildings and Homes? I see. Yeah, Aaron we're usually see. first. So I know. I just shake things great up. Great to go second this time. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> you know, I grew up with a name towards the end of the alphabet, and it was really lame. <laughs> I was going to be first. Um, well, we just kind of wanted to give an update, sort of, you know, Buildings and Homes obviously has been focused a lot on um, the rollout of Energized Denver um, ordinance, you know, the, um, the first off outreach, implementation, compliance, sort of, you know, just being a sounding board for the CASR staff to, um, you know, to be really be thinking about a lot of all of these facets of that. It's, it's, it's huge. We feel like, at least I personally feel like, for as much as we've been trying to get the word out, it's still gonna it's it's gonna hit people pretty pretty hard um, when it you know when it comes time to um, you know when full implementation rolls out for for the different categories. Um, so I guess uh, with Stephen's help, we'll just kind of hit a, a few of the highlights. You know, we've really we've had a lot of talk around um, you know under resourced buildings and and. Um, how the ordinance um, might have unintended consequences for, you know, commu disadvantaged communities or communities of color or, um, you know, low income folks. So there's been a lot of um, discussion and, and gathering of a lot of stakeholders to talk about um, resources and assistance and, and helping those those people in those buildings um, access those that assistance and, and getting compliance. Um, Again, a lot of talk about just outreach and, and getting the word out in the best possible way, um, you know, and to to really help people feel more like the city is helping people come along rather than just coming with the fines and with the, um, you know, with the with, with the downside of, of not being in compliance. Um, Stephen, you want to touch on anything else about sort of the rollout of Energized Denver? No, I mean, you know, we we were a sounding board for the resource hub. If you guys haven't visited that yet, I would highly recommend you go to that page and and see what the city is doing to support 
um, the buildings with, with getting into compliance. I think there's still a struggle with some properties not even part of the benchmarking yet. And so, you know, we've we've been working. There was a prior prior to Energized Denver ordinance. There was an Energized Denver group that kind of had started meeting even before all this. You know, back in 2019. So even pre Grace time. Um, and we, we struggled with how do we out, reach out to those buildings that aren't in compliance and typically those are under-resourced, um, either the ownership and or management, you know, are not necessarily as sophisticated. They don't have on-site management teams and things to where the tenants don't understand that stuff's going on. And so how do we get, that was one of the big conversations I think is how do we get tenants of those buildings to, to understand what's going on so that maybe they can help, you know, put some of that pressure on the owners that they're that they're renting from. Yep. Um, and then just a few other things I think that um, are worth mentioning, especially over the past few months, um, the Buildings and Homes um, Subcommittee um, reviewed and, and approved and recommended winners for the Energized Denver Award. Um, so I'm sure somebody has a link to see those that I would love it if, if you could throw that in the chat. I can um, throw that in the chat, Aaron. It's in the it's it came out in the CREJ, Colorado Real Estate Journal today. Oh great. So I'll put that link in the chat. Um, and then also um, you know, new codes, new building codes. Um, we've we've really had a lot of input and, and a lot of discussion around specific areas to um, to be interacting with CPD on on new codes that are coming out in the next couple of months, especially around um, electrification. Um, you know, there's some changes in the ordinance around how, um, you know, heat pumps and natural gas fired appliances, uh, you, you know, e uh, equity and how those, how, how that permitting process works. Um, that'll be one of the first big changes of uh, the ordinance going into, into play in the next couple of months. Um, and then a recent topic of conversation was about um, landscaping requirements um, in code and in, um, in, in zoning. So there's a group right now, a, a sub subcommittee uh, of our group that's that's working on that um, and putting some uh, proposals together. And when that came out of the fact that the green building ordinance um, that was implemented after the green roof initiative was passed, um, there there are a lot of things within the green building ordinance that are now part of code and so if the landscaping piece is the only thing that's kind of left that's kind of keeping that is can we figure out a way to ensure that code would handle everything that is in the green building ordinance so that we don't need all these different um because owners get confused um you know and there were conversations with net zero energy and some conflicts even i think with green building ordinance and all these other things. So how can we kind of make things simplified? And it seems like that the landscaping um, piece of the green building ordinance is something that we can move into regular code that would then make the green build, everything in the green building ordinance would just be in regular code and we wouldn't need that as a special um, section any longer. But that we know that's gonna require working with other, for Grace's group to work with other departments at figuring out how do we Kind of make that but we feel like that there is a way to do it over the course of the next year great thanks um any questions for the buildings and homes committee all right then how about if i go over to lori uh for the zero waste team i just figured out that zero waste is last so not anymore not today <laughs> thank you <laughs> And we haven't been zero waste that long that we're, we quite have our identity figured out that way. Um, I think what I'd say for our committee is that um, our good ideas haven't really been needed in this last, in 2022, because there are so many ideas coming forward on the zero waste topic. So we've been working more um, garnering support or, or discussing um, how you do education and outreach. It started with the expanded waste services, which passed by council and is rolling out in January, you know, with, with paying for trash by volume and how that program is handled and how well it rolls out. It's gonna have a lot, it's it's what you were talking about, about fines and, and compliance, enforced compliance versus getting people on board because they understand why we're doing it and what it accomplishes. So for this year, we're talking about how do we, it's, it's, gone, it's 
at Dottie now and how do we work with them? How do we provide our expertise or our ideas and in the rollout, both in education and looking at the infrastructure and capacity. One, one development that just happened is one of our committee members was just hired by them to do the uh, outreach and communication on this program. So <laughs> I think we have a, a nice strong link there and she's gonna to present to us next time in her new capacity. Um, and we feel really good that we have teamwork that we can do now going forward. So we look to that rollout. The recycling starts in, I think, January twice a week. And then in the summer, they do the compost. So we have a lot of uh, rich material to look at in terms of education, in terms of universal signage, in terms of all the issues that arise. And then Waste No More passed. And so that, you know, and that one passed with um, a very wonky schedule because it's supposed to have started six months ago. And as I understand it, Grace has taken on working with a committee that's being appointed to, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but sort of figure out the best implementation of that and how, how it goes forward. And we're you want, you want to take that, Grace? Sure. Just to say, yes, the objective of the task force, which for any of you who, who are here in the days of the um, green building ordinance, there was a task force made for that as well to make recommendations to the city on uh, how to tweak or uh, revise the ballot language so that it's an actual city ordinance language uh, to make sure that it is implementable and enforceable. So yes, and I, I did send that uh, link out to everybody, but I can drop it into the chat again. And Naomi, I think we're hoping your hands some, of our, some of our committee members will be on that committee as well so that we'll be networking that way and I was going to uh, ask Lori if you guys were going to apply that was my question I think individually some of the people are very eager to be on there yes great yeah um I mean it just it just makes sense right how many different committees do you need looking at these things um so again it's you know it's focused in a lot of ways on capacity infrastructure and education and um we'll be taking those in gulps as we can and helping any way we can and finally, we are we still have some portion of our committee that's very, very interested in food waste. And I, I do think that's an area where there's gaps and a lot of opportunities. So we're trying to work specifically to develop ideas in the restaurant industry and, and uh, see where we go forward with food. But for the other two, we feel like there's plenty of direction and, and it's just a matter of implementation. So, Stuart. Um, is there a formal plan for evaluating the effectiveness of the of the uh, initiative with zero with the um, waste charge to determine whether or not it's having a sufficient impact on air quality um, and and things of that nature? Are we going to quantify this? Are you talking about? Yeah, go ahead. Greg. Yeah, who's that question for? Me? Well, for either for either. You're asking if we can quantify the impact, the air quality impact of composting? No yeah. I mean, after all, this is being done for the purposes of climate change. And I believe that every measure can have some, some form of measurement to determine its effectiveness. And we can do it on paper. We can't do it with actual air quality monitoring. Okay, that we can do. but we will do it on paper. So we will be able to say okay. that it resulted in this. On paper. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> Stephen. If you find out through your group regarding haulers from a standpoint of the composting, my members are finding it very, 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 very difficult to find people to do the composting for them. A lot of the major haulers don't do that any longer or whatever, or if they ever did it, I don't, I haven't been in Denver long enough to know, but um, I would love to get some names of companies that I could give to my members. There's Republic Plaza just signed a contract with a very small one that just the contract with their buildings kind of pushing them at the brink of their um, their uh, capacity at the moment. So how do they kind of start, you know, ramping up their capacity? Because I think they specialize in composting, but we're struggling finding people to do it. So I'd love to get some names if you could provide that. 
Yeah, I think that's the crux of the big concern with waste no more is the capacity, particularly with composting and with the new new tightening of requirements on the ones that are doing it now. And Grace, you can add to that, but um, I think that's a big focus and a big worry. I think that's going to come up in the context of the task force in terms of, um, is this a word, implementability, right, or enforceability. <laughs> so if a building has done everything, it's it, like if it proves to the city, hey, I've contacted every compost hauler in the region and they've all rejected me, my request because uh, they're all full, then how are we, then we can't find, or could we continue to find that building for not complying? So that will undoubtedly come up in the task force. Yes. So we find ourselves in a place where we don't need a lot of new initiatives. We simply need to really work to make sure that those that are in place, you know, have credibility and are, are done in a way that builds support instead of resistance. So that's my report. Thanks, Lori. Any other questions for Zero Waste? All right, I'm going to go over to Environmental Justice to Jason and Lumda. Thanks, Grace. Uh, Happy New Year, everyone. It's good to see your faces. Um, so my report out in 2022, we had a great opportunity to do two major tasks is originally what we had planned, one of which we got done. Um, which was providing official guidance uh, to the uh, to SAC uh, in case on the definition uh, and examples of the neighborhood-based environmental justice programs uh, and neighborhood-based uh, climate justice programs uh, as an allowable use uh, of the Climate Protection Fund. Uh, now that we've gotten that done and we've uh, gotten over that mountain, uh, we are focusing our attention on um, providing guidance and recommendations on setting up an environmental uh, support fund pilot. And that's mentioned in the climate uh, 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 protection funds five-year plan. And so that essentially is just, uh, you know, we're wanting to help environmental justice communities have more meaningful participation, more representation on air um, and, and water quality rulemaking proceedings. Um, and from what I gather, we have what four starting in February uh, to do. So timing is of the essence. So we'll be starting that conversation um, in our next meeting. Well, we've already started that conversation. We'll continue that conversation our next meeting, um, and hopefully submitting recommendations to create an RF, RFP for that project. In addition, Lutna, did you have anything to add to that? You're on mute. Um, I could touch on what we will be kind of focusing on um, moving forward. Do you want to do that now, Jason? Okay, that sounds good. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for providing the overview of kind of um, highlights from 2022. Um, Jason kind of covered a lot of this, but, um, you know, at our January meeting, which is just happening um, in about two or three weeks, um, we are going to kind of focus on some intersectionality between our committees and um, hear a presentation from the transportation committee on um, a recommendation that they would like to propose and get the EJ committee's um, input on um, in that proposal in particular is specific to like a parking policy um, and um, involves the communities of West Colfax and Sun Valley. So we'll be hearing that proposal um, or you know recommended proposal from the transportation committee on the parking policy and then um, potentially hearing from residents from those communities as well. Um, and then as Jason mentioned, uh, we are gonna kind of really spend a lot of this year focusing on the EJ support fund and looking at proposals that either, you know, committee members within the EJ committee um, or really anybody would like to put forth um, in which case those proposals could go to CASER and then CASER could, um, essentially develop an RFP around those proposals um, so that, that those projects could get funded. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about uh, what we're gonna be focusing on in the next month or so. Um, and then Jason, I wasn't sure if you wanted to provide an update to the group. 
Um, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, just on my end for um, for the Sustainability Advisory Council, I will likely not be, um, I will not be um, at the next quarterly meeting. Uh, the fun world of Zoom is that um, we don't know when people are pregnant or not. I am eight months pregnant. <laughs> so I will be out on maternity leave um, starting next, end of next month. Um, and so I, um, you know, we're just trying to figure out if uh, somebody will kind of step in for me while I'm out on maternity leave, um, which will be, I'll be out for uh, March, April, and May, um, and, you know, plan to return in June, but, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be figuring that out, but just a little heads up is if you, if you don't see me at the next meeting, it's not because I don't love you all and don't love this work, it's uh, <laughs> just because I'm caring for a child, so. <laughs> Congrats. We, we we are super excited about that. I am particularly, everybody knows that. So <laughs> all right. Oh, go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, I, I, I want to revisit my question because it came up in a discussion with neighbors. And I honestly don't know what I'm going to say back to them. We were out talking about the new charge for garbage. And the question that was posed to me was we're being taxed for this climate protection fund and what are we getting from it and then we're going to be charged now for our garbage what are we getting from it and i know that this is very difficult and it's been you know air quality districts around the country struggle to to justify these types of expenditures um but each of these things at some point we need to report back and it would be helpful for me that in these approved initiatives that we know what that report back is and what the feedback is going to be because people like to equate you know their actions their dollars with what they're getting in the way of reductions and you know maybe it's our fault in the transportation committee we don't put enough of an emphasis on trying to measure things but um i think it's an accountability issue and, and, and honestly it's one neighbor who's pissed is about having to pay for garbage you know and other things so um but but uh i i think doing it on paper i don't understand what are the metrics? Are, are we putting oh. metrics together? Okay, hang on. Because we I want to make sure that we finish with any questions for the Environmental Justice Committee. Because you went back to something else. I thought we were done. I just, but I, I guess I just want to ask, did anybody have any questions for the Environmental Justice Committee? No. Okay. Mr. Cashman, you have your hand raised. Is it the same question you just put in the chat? Yeah, uh, Stuart, I, it sounds to me like your question is regarding the city's volume-based trash program. Yes. As opposed to waste no more, which is what I thought, which is what Grace is talking about as far as the uh, 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 task force she's putting together. And, and as, as references the city's volume-based program, yes, there will be regular reports. Okay, so I'll take, I need okay. to take your question in two parts, Stuart. Yes. So with the Climate Protection Fund, you know that we are required to submit an annual report or publish an annual report every year. So we do. And so that is separate and apart from this Dottie's uh, volume-based pricing program. Okay. Um, I think what you're trying to get at though is for all the money that the city is spending on climate initiatives, can we show a direct correlation between what the money that we're spending on and greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Now we do a greenhouse gas emissions inventory every year. We would like to see, we hope to see that going down, but there are so many factors. And to be honest, we only have $40 million. So, you know, the being able to show that our e-bike rebate or the home energy rebate or the home affordable home, healthy affordable homes program that all of those combined that we can say, oh, look, now we've seen 
a 10% reduction in emissions in Denver just due to our programs. That just isn't how climate accounting works. And that it is a struggle for us. And we know that we need to be able to show that type of direct correlation. And so it is top of mind for us. Our next annual report for our office is due out every, it's due every year by June 30th. And so we know that we want to start to produce that type of correlation to the extent that we can, but it just isn't easy. There are so many, um, there are many more emission sources than we are able to control with the dollars that we have. No, thank you. I, and I did commingle two ideas. Thank you for breaking them out. Okay. And I say the same thing, you know, when it comes to the emissions from a particular source, and in, in the case you're talking about with um, waste emissions, the, the actual source is where that is counted is at the landfill or okay. at the, you know, at A1 or at Colorado, you know, compost or compost Colorado. Um, that is measured. There's different ways, right? So there's actual air quality monitors around town that measure emissions. There's um, the emissions that are required by the EPA and, and by the state uh, regulatory agencies on the entities that run those landfills. So there's a lot of different places where we get that data. So that's what we bring into our emissions inventory for the city. Um, but again, there's just, it's more, there, again, there are more sources than our dollars are able to control. So we do need to tell the story on it accurately mm -hmm. and with transparency. So we're working on it. Okay, I have to get back to the um, report outs. My romper room face. Well, energy, of course, already spoke. I don't think you guys don't need to say, is there anything else you want to talk about? Energy? Um, no, I mean, our, our last quarter, we've been working, um, you know, Drew in for Johnny on these recommendations. Uh, we've had split into three subcommittees, two of the subcommittees produced proposals for this quarter's meeting. Um, the only reason the third one didn't is we had a critical mass of absences over the holiday uh, in December. Um, so you can expect even one more proposal from us, um, hopefully by at least by next quarter's meeting. Um, but no, pretty much um, we've been working on the fruits of our labors of in what the discussions were uh, were had today, which were amazing. So okay, that's all we had. Thank you. And um, I also noted that Jay had to leave, and his update was in the chat. So yes, yeah, so Leah, um, Lisa Reyes Mason did. Uh, submit her resignation um, from not only co-chair, but from the committee too, but she had a big uh, big new job at work. So she just needs to dial back her, her other responsibilities. And yeah, you might recall that the science committee had talked about launching a speakers bureau. And so um, they have made me the first speaker, which is very nice. So I will be um, addressing a group of medical professionals um, from CU Anschutz. And so uh, that's happening on the 17th. So Hopefully I won't be completely out over my skis as we say here in Colorado. Um, and all right, so I see Naomi's got a comment in the chat too. I wanna make sure I haven't forgotten any. Oh, there is one other, I had my own agenda item. Just a minor thing. This is a food for thought for your next couple of months of meetings. You may be aware that we have a mayoral election coming up. And um, so, and I know, and, and and council elections too, right, Mr. Cashman? I'm not going to say that you have to do this, but I think it would be interesting for the committees to consider, right, whether you write a letter or whether you write a position statement to the incoming administration to say, here's who we are, here's what we've been doing, here's what we think you should do in your administration. Like, here are some goals we think you should set in these subject areas. And um, I'll give you an example. So I, you, you may know that our office is in charge of Executive Order 123. We call it XO 123. And it is, the executive orders are policies that apply to city agencies. So there are things that we need to do. So XO 123 is a very large sustainability policy. And it has I think it has seven chapters. So each of our common subject mat subject areas have their own chapter. And it's quite outdated. It hasn't been updated um, since well before I got here, I think since 2014. And part of the reason why it hasn't been updated is that the process to update it with the city is quite challenging. Um, you actually, the there's a committee of other agency heads 
who have to review all the executive orders. And they don't want you to bring just one chapter at a time. If you're going to update it, they want the whole thing updated. And so because each one of those for us is a separate like internal intra-agency task force, it just hasn't gotten done. And so our recommendation to the new administration is going to be to break it up, to actually eliminate XO123 and in its place, like replace it with separate executive orders on each of those subjects. So buildings would be its own, the city fleet or transportation would be its own, procurement would be its own. And that will just make it much easier to update them over the years. It will also make it easier to manage, again, like an internal committee for each of those subjects rather than having to try to get people's work plans um, to address these every few years. So that's one recommendation, one package that I'll be presenting to the next administration. And I just want to suggest that perhaps you would consider doing the same. Not a requirement, but it is something you could talk about with your committees. This change is coming. And I'm sure that whoever the next mayor and their administration will be, and then there will definitely be at least a few new council members, they would be very interested to hear what you have to say. So I just wanted to leave you with that thought. Oh, I skipped climate adaptation. Thanks, Lori. And that's me. That is Jim. You are here because Lorena had to leave earlier. Thank you. And I'm so sorry. Oh, that's all right. And, and I did put the, uh, you one of the newer committees. So I put the description of the committee in the chat for those that don't remember. Our purpose, uh, our, our update is super, super short. We're still ramping up. We've identified about seven different potential priority areas for us to focus on and broken up into two subcommittees. Both of them focus on are titled Natural Climate Solutions. One is Natural Climate Solutions City, which is focused on looking at a number of citywide issues. Um, I understand that some folks on that subcommittee are partnering with the Building and Homes Committee to look at some green building code issues. So I, I, I like the idea of some cross committee um, partnership collaboration. So that's great. And the second one is focused on more community based project, uh, natural climate solutions stuff. And we are working in independent subcommittees and then coming back at our next committee meeting to have some more ideas fully fleshed out with the goal of bringing a recommendation or two to this group at its next meeting. That's it, Grace. And I have a question for you, Grace. And I don't, I don't, and I'm embarrassed that I don't know this. Are, do you serve at the pleasure of the mayor or will you stay on board as the administration changes? Yes, and maybe. Um, so <laughs> yes, I am an appointee. And uh, so my fate rests with the next administration and uh, we'll just, I'm, I'm here. I will continue doing my job no matter what. So we'll see if they ask me to stay on and if they don't, they don't. Um, I think, and thank you again, I, I apologize. And Brad is here. He's the liaison to the Climate Adaptation and Resiliency Committee. Brad, did you wanna add anything since you're here? Um. No, I think Jim covered both our committees. I'm I'm on the uh, I'm listening in on the city subcommittee for our group, and um, yeah, we're we're looking in to to some things on that. And but Jim did a really good job. Okay, and there's a couple other things in the chat. First, some folks have asked that I send you the um, XO one two three, and then send you a summary of what I just said. And so I will do that. So you can consider that for your committees as well. And then uh, Armando, speaking of changing the guard, your term as chair ends in April. Um, what can we do to help prepare for that transition? So for all, for any of you, if you are coming up on your term limit as chair, or if you're just feeling like your time as chair is up, um, there's a couple of different things we can do. First, if you are currently the chair and your term is coming up this spring and you would like to continue, um, discuss that with your liaison, and uh, I can't imagine that we would have an issue with that. If you either, your term is up and you would like to end, or you're just kind of done being chair, also bring it up with your liaison, and we'll work on that. I believe that the bylaws um, indicate that, gen I think, generally, we would like the a new chair person to be someone who's been on the committee and um, you know has a sense for the group, but I actually don't think that's a requirement. We had that as a requirement in the draft last year, but I think we took that out because sometimes when you have a new person come in, they might actually be really dynamic and be, would be great for chair. Um, interestingly, we have not lost a lot of members over the last year since we added new people in April of the of this what 2022. So we don't 
as of right now, I don't think we have a real need for another application to bring people in, but that's something also to look at with your um, other co-chairs who may not be here and with your liaison. If you would like to have an application out to bring some new folks in and, and fill some empty seats, we can do that. Uh, if you do wanna do that, I just would like to have that information sooner rather than later. So same thing with the co-chair. If you are done being co-chair, talk about it with your liaison. And we'll get that ball rolling uh, to make sure that folks who are currently on the committee know that they have an opportunity to step up. Um, all right, well, we're doing really well on time. I think we've come to the end of our regular business. Does anybody have any announcements or other news they would like to share? I'm not seeing any. So Lubna, all I'm gonna say is that maybe in, what is it, June-ish? We would love to see another little face with you on the screen. You'd be welcome to bring your child to committee day if anyone's interested. So good luck to you. Have Oh, Stuart, go ahead. I see your hand. Yeah, sorry. I should have said this earlier. Effective January 1st of this year, um, the House Bill 1026 uh, takes effect. And, and that allows employers to get a tax credit of up to 50% for things that they spend on behalf of their employees commute. So if they have an eco pass, a half, half of that can get written off. Um, we don't have the nitty gritty details because the Department of Revenue won't have those until midsummer. But um, I'm probably going to send all of you a fact sheet because we're trying to get the word out as fast as we can. Uh, this will hopefully have a dramatic impact on providing transit passes in the workplace. Great. Thanks, Stuart. And congratulations on that win. Great. Any other announcements? Yeah, I'm going to put in the chat. I think most of you know, I work for the Denver Foundation and our community grants program is opening up its new cycle starting January 15th. Um, it's a great source for nonprofits to get general operating funds from twenty dollars to $50,000. Um, and Climate and environment is a space that we fund in, so renewable energy, energy efficiency, and air quality, both those that are doing programmatic work, but also systems change policy work. So um, the, our team will be hosting a few um, info sessions that people can join, but it's a great source uh, of funding, and we love to bolster our um, climate and environment grantees. So check it out and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks very much. Great. Any other announcements? All right, well, then everybody have a, again, have a happy start to your new year. Wonderful to see you all. Stay warm. And um, we'll see you in a couple of months. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, all.